This is lecture 17 on skeletal muscle 3. We'll be looking at whole muscle function in different muscle fiber types in this lecture. So first when looking at the whole muscle function, we're going to continue from where we left off in lecture 16 talking about energy systems and discuss fatigue. So fatigue comes in two types and fatigue is generally defined as when a muscle can no longer perform at the required activity level. Now the two types of fatigue are peripheral and central fatigue. Now peripheral fatigue is where the mechanism occurs between the neuromuscular junction and the contractile or energetic elements of muscular fibers. There are multiple possible causes and many theories about the cause of peripheral fatigue that involve phosphate. Some possible causes or reasons why peripheral fatigue occurs are the depletion of muscle glycogen or phosphocreatine, the increased phosphate from breakdown of phosphocreatine, and this slows the phosphate removal from the myosin head and alters the power stroke. Changes in the pH of the muscle fiber sarcolemma. Uh, typically, it's going to be a lowering of the pH and an increase in acidity. An increased potassium in the T tubule extracellular fluid that alters the local membrane potentials and decreases calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So these are some of the causes of peripheral fatigue. So they're going to actually be physiological causes. Central fatigue is also called pseudo fatigue and it typically originates in the central nervous system and it precedes peripheral fatigue. It is very subjective. Uh, sometimes it can be caused by imbalances in central uh, nervous system neurotransmitters, but quite simply, we don't really know. It appears to be very much a mental type of fatigue that in many cases can be overcome. Now, when we talked about fatigue, we're talking about pushing the muscle beyond what it's capable of or to its very limits. And this means that in some cases, we're going to get to insufficient oxygen. Now, under conditions of insufficient oxygen, glycolysis can quickly produce ATP. Here, there's going to be a buildup of lactic acid as a byproduct because of the absence of oxygen. And this will cause a lowering of the pH due to lactic acid buildup. Faster ATP production is caused by this, but not as efficient as aerobic metabolism. So this is the process of anaerobic glycolysis. Now we talked about the process of glycolysis where we take that glucose and we make two pyruvate molecules and two ATP. And this is gonna be broken down from the glycogen stores that we have. However, if we don't have oxygen, we can't go into the mitochondria to actually make more ATP and go through the citric acid cycle in the electron transport chain. So we have to rely on glycolysis to keep producing ATP, but in this case, pyruvate will start to make more lactate or lactic acid. Now, while we're going through this process of insufficient oxygen, we're generating an oxygen debt over time as we continually produce pyruvate and then lactic acid in order to get ATP. However, during our recovery period where we have available oxygen, maybe we finished a run and now we're sitting down and resting, our intracellular conditions can return to normal. Now this could be a few hours or in some cases, it could take a few days depending upon how strenuous the activity is. The oxygen available is in abundance and ATV production is primarily through aerobic metabolism as it's more efficient. So this is going to be a process of recovery. Now this recovery period is going to allow lactate to convert back to pyruvate. Our pyruvate can be used to generate more ATP by the mitochondria or used to aid in the synthesis of glucose and glycogen reserves. So this is that process where we have oxygen available after that time period where it wasn't available. So we've done a very strenuous workout or strenuous physical activity and now we're resting. Here, oxygen is very present. So we can actually take lactate and convert it back into pyruvate and make more glucose from it in order to actually facilitate the creation of more ATP. So during this process, we're actually rebuilding all of our energy stores over time. A key concept to understand from glycolysis to aerobic metabolism is that when we're undergoing anaerobic glycolysis, we're starting to generate debt. That debt needs to be repaid later on after we return to rest. So 
if we go for a very strenuous run, we're working out very, very hard, we're generating debt, and then when we're done with the run, we sit down and we're still breathing very heavily and we feel elevated body temperature. We feel that our body's still kind of racing to try to recover from that strenuous effort of our run. That is called excess post-exercise oxygen consumption or EPOC. This excess post-exercise oxygen consumption means that we're keeping our oxygen consumption levels very high following our exercise bout. And this is in order to replace that oxygen debt that we accumulated during our first phase. Now, some of the lactate that is produced by muscle fibers during anaerobic activity is released into the blood and carried to the liver. Here, the liver can absorb and convert lactate to pyruvate and then to glucose, where it is either stored in the liver or released to the blood. This is called lactate cycling or the Cori cycle. Here we can see a representation of the Cori cycle. In the bottom of the muscle, glycogen reserves are in the muscle. They get broken down, converted to glucose, which that gets converted to pyruvate to make ATP. If no oxygen is present, that pyruvate is then going to become lactate. Now lactate, like I said, is going to be shuttled into the liver. And once it's shuttled into the liver, it can be converted back to pyruvate into the liver and therefore converted into more ATP and then back into glucose. So this process is the Cori cycle or lactate shuttling. Other lactate is converted into glycogen or used as a fuel by some muscle fibers as it go, comes back into the system. Switching gears here, you'll recall in our last lecture, we talked about muscle fiber twitches and muscle twitch duration that has a range of 10 to 100 milliseconds. Now that's due to there being different types of muscle fibers. Some are slow and some are fast. Skeletal muscle fiber types are determined by their myosin chain heavy form or MHC. This is a composition of proteins used to make up the myosin. The varying compositions determine how fast it will contract. Here are three types. Type 1, slow twitch, type 2A, fast twitch, or an in, in intermediate, and type 2X, fast twitch. We're going to start with type 1, or slow twitch oxidative fibers, when looking at the muscle fiber types. Now this has the slowest tension development. It is very fatigue resistant, and it has a dark red color. This is from myoglobin, as well as heavy amounts of blood vessels. There's a greater percentage of slow twitch, fiber, slow twitch fibers in postural muscles as they consistently get used to maintain our overall body position. An example of use for slow twitch would be a marathon runner, as this is going to be very oxidative, long duration activity. Here we can see examples at deep inside the soleus of the slow fibers in a cross section. Notice they're deeper red color and their thinner overall appearance. Next is type 2A or fast twitch glycolytic fibers. Now they have a fast tension but they're slower than our type 2X and we can use either they can use either aerobic or anaerobic metabolism with their intermediate tension speed and they have an intermediate color with some myoglobin. Now they are found in greater proportion in prime mover muscles like quads and hamstrings. Now the percentage of these can vary though, and this is, depends a great deal upon training and genetics. So you can be born with a certain amount, like if both of your parents were, uh, were top level 100 meter sprinters or they came from a power athletics background, they would have more type 2A. If both of your parents and a lot of your family were distance runners, you would probably be born with more type 1. That said, you can change this over time if you actually train. So if you're born from a family of sprinters, but you find that you like distance running, you can get better at distance running and develop more type one. Now type 2A, an example of their use would be in a 100 meter sprinter. The final type is type 2X. Now this is fast twitch, glycolytic. It's way faster than type 2A. This is the fastest developed tension. It has little mitochondria and no myoglobin. It fatigues very quickly and has a low capillary su supply. It's typically found in eye muscles and has and uh, other quick response muscles. An example of this would be the, 
uh, as far as an action would be like a baseball pitch to where it's going to be very aggressive, powerful production, but not take very long for the activity to take place. Here we can see some of the fast fibers. Notice how much larger they are than our slow twitch fibers that we've seen previously. Very large, very thick. Here we can see a cross-sectional view of a typical muscle in the body. And notice the different colors where some are darker, some are lighter, and it's going to be interspersed throughout. This is because that all muscles in the body have type 1, have type 2A, and have type 2X in varying degrees. While there are three primary fiber types, there are many hybrid fiber types in between the slow and fast twitch. These hybrid fibers are variation and combinations of slow twitch and fast twitch fibers and are called transitional fibers. That is to say they are in transition from slow to fast or from fast to slow. Now several factors determine fiber typing, but none more so than the type of exercise and genetic makeup. Those are going to be the biggest factors that determine this. So now that we've talked about the muscle fiber types, I want to revisit some of how we actually talk to the muscle fibers themselves. And this is with regards to the motor unit. Remember that muscle fibers do not function alone. They are actually going to be commanded by a motor neuron. A single motor neuron is actually going to communicate with multiple muscle fibers at the same time. This is going to create what we call a motor unit. Now the size of the motor unit varies with muscle control. An example is the external eye muscle requires very precise control. So here a motor neuron might only innervate with four to six muscle fibers. Whereas a leg muscle, like say the quadricep, just needs gross muscle control in order to exert force. So here, one motor neuron can innervate with 1,000 to 2,000 muscle fibers. The muscle fibers of different motor units are intermingled throughout, so it's going to have a lot of different uh, combinations. And we'll take a look at this in this diagram. So here we can see an example of three different motor units in the tricep. Now, let's take a look first at motor unit one, or the red motor unit. That motor neuron is going to innervate and connect with all of the red muscle fibers that you see in the picture. Now let's take one of these muscle fibers out and let's say we find that it's a type one muscle fiber. Well, that means all of the muscle fibers under that motor unit are gonna be of type one. That's a very important thing to actually know is that all fibers in a given motor unit are of the same type. Now, they can transition, as we've stated before, into different fiber types, but all of the muscle fibers will transition. It is also important to note that remember when a motor neuron is activated, it activates all the muscle fibers under its control. So if motor unit two, the blue motor unit gets activated, all of the blue fibers will contract at the same time. Now, how do motor units work together? Because we're not just activating one, we're going to be activating several of them. Well, in this case, we call it recruitment. And recruitment works in that smaller motor units are activated first. We use smaller ones and gradually increase to more powerful motor units with faster and more powerful fibers as they are required. Our body likes to do the least amount of work possible. So this is why it's important to work up in weight or gradually warm up the body before engaging in a larger activity. This recruitment pattern results in smooth, steady increase in muscle tension as opposed to a violent increase in muscle tension. Now, if we're trying to produce sustained muscular contraction, we have a wonderful thing called asynchronous motor unit summation that allows us to achieve this. Here, motor units are activated on a rotating basis to maintain a sustained contraction and help to prevent fatigue. So here we can see an example of asynchronous recruitment, where it's going motor unit one, motor unit two, motor unit three, and then it goes back to motor unit one, motor unit two, motor unit three. By activating these units over time, it's able to maintain greater overall tension without fatiguing. Now, activating a motor unit is typically a voluntary experience, but in some cases, we do have an involuntary aspect of skeletal muscle. This is called muscle tone. 
Muscle tone is the resting tension in a skeletal muscle, and it's the result of a variable number of motor units that are always active to produce low level tension, but not enough to produce movement. It just kind of keeps the sarcomeres lined up and moving a little bit. This is regulated at the subconscious level and it's activate, uh, the activated muscle fibers use energy. So if you have an elevated muscle tone, this increases the energy consumption resulting in a higher resting metabolism. So if you have a tighter overall body, greater overall tone, you're gonna be burning more energy. That said, if you have a constant high tone, it also means that you aren't going to be able to produce as much force with your muscles. So muscle tone is the result of lifestyle, uh, different postures that you engage in, and it's learned over time by your body. We're now gonna talk about the different types of contractions that a muscle can engage in. There's really two major types, isotonic and isometric, but isotonic is actually broken down into two types. Isotonic contractions are where tension rises and the skeletal muscle length changes. This occurs when we lift an object, walk, or run. The two types of contractions are concentric, shortening, and eccentric, lengthening. Concentric contraction, the muscle tension rises until it exceeds the load and the muscle shortens. Tension remains constant. So an example here, flexing the elbow from an extended position, so curling the dumbbell. Most actions that initiate a contraction or a movement are gonna be concentric in nature. Here we can see that muscle has uh, is attached on both sides to a two kilo weight. It contracts, it shortens, it lifts the weight. This is an isotonic concentric contraction. Eccentric is the opposite of concentric. Where concentric shortens, eccentric lengthens. Here, the load is more than peak tension produced. And so the muscle lengthens. So the, an example of this would be returning the dumbbell from the flex position to extended. So it's going to be controlling the negative or running downhill. Now the eccentric contraction, the contraction ends when the load stretches the muscle until the muscle tears, tendon breaks, or it lets go of the load. Here we can see an example. We're supporting that we have the muscle attached on both ends with the six kilogram weight. We remove the table and it's contracting, trying to hold on to that six kilos. But as you saw before in the previous diagram, the muscle can only hold that two kilos and shorten it. So this is too much. So it's contracting, but lengthening. The last type of contraction is isometric. We've seen concentric where we move and close the joint, eccentric where we lengthen, it's lengthening. Isometric is where the muscle contracts, but it doesn't shorten and there's no movement. So isometric contractions, the muscle length does not change, the tension never exceeds the load, and the contracting muscle bulges, but not as much during an isotonic contraction. Here, individual muscle fibers shorten only due to connective tissue stretching. Now, typically an example of this is postural muscles contracting, but you could also do something like um, a plank or uh, just holding the weight in place. Now, here's an example of that isometric contraction. We can see the muscle is bulging, but it's not moving. It's not able to lift the weight, but it's supported. And examples of this would be plank, uh, trying to pull your hands apart, any type of hold position exercise. Now that we've discussed muscular contraction, looking specifically at isotonic and isometric, we're now going to talk about muscle actions and joint movements. Now, this is going to occur in three major types of movement, linear movements or gliding, angular movements, as well as circumduction, and then rotation. Now, all of those major dynamic movements are possible in synovial joints. Remember that synovial joints all share different characteristics where they have a capsule, synovial fluid, and allow for bones to articulate against one another. The three major types of joints that we'll actually be covering will be the hinge joint. An example of this is going to be the elbow or the knee, and this is going to be a uniaxial joint to where it can move on one axis and just perform flexion and extension. The ball and socket joint is going to be far more complicated and allows the greatest degree of movement. This, a great example of this would be the shoulder where the humerus and the scapula meet or the hip joint 
where the actual femur would meet the uh, coxal bone of the hip. The final joint is a very unique one to humans. It's called the saddle joint, and only one of these actually exists in the body. It's where the thumb meets the trapezium and allows for the movement we call opposition. And it's going to allow us to grasp or grab things. Breaking down some of the different movements we discussed, linear movements are two bones gliding past each other. They are non-axial in nature and simply allow for greater movements at other joints to occur. Examples of these would be the carpal bones of the wrist as they move past each other, or the tarsal bones of the feet. Another good example of this is where the clavicle and sternum meet at the sternoclavicular joint, allowing a little bit of gliding to happen past each other to facilitate greater movement at the shoulder joint itself. Angular movements would be examples of abduction or adduction and flexion and extension. Here we can see some examples of these different movements. Abduction and adduction can occur at both the shoulder or leg. It also occurs with the hand as well. Abduction is going to be the process of moving away from the axis of the body or opening the legs up. Adduction is going to be adding. It's going to be moving towards the long axis, bringing the arm down, closing the fingers, moving the legs together. This is adduction. Flexion and extension are simple movements of this. Here we can see examples of flexion and extension. Flexion is going to be closing the joint off, decreasing the angle of articulation in the anterior or posterior plane. Extension is the opposite. It increases the angle of articulation. We notice here an example of extension is extending the elbow like a tricep extension. Flexion would be performing a bicep curl. Extension of the hip would be kicking back with a straight leg using the glutes. Flexion of the hip would actually be pulling the hip up, feeling your hip flexors or iliopsoas engage. Now there are different rotational movements that we have to cover as well. These would be things like pronation and supination, which occurs at the hand, and different special movements. Inversion, eversion, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, as well as lateral flexion, protraction, retraction, opposition, and depression and elevation. Here we can see examples of rotation. First at the head, where we can turn our head left or right. We have internal or medial rotation of the actual uh, humerus as well as the femur and this is going to be anterior we turn the anterior aspect of the limb towards the ventral side of the body opposing that would be external or lateral rotation taking the anterior aspect of the limb and rotating it towards the dorsal side now for both internal and external rotation we can use the humerus we can also use the femur as well Pronation and supination are going to occur at the distal end of the bones of the form and we can rotate them around each other because it's a pivot joint Pronation is going to be pointing in anatomical position. We turn our hand around and face it posteriorly. If you hold the arm out straight with the palm facing upwards and turn the hand down, that'd be like pouring the soup. So pour the soup is pronation, holding the soup, turning the hand upwards, facing the palm in anatomical position would be supination. And here we have an example of lateral flexion where we're bending the vertebral column from side to side. Protraction and retraction can happen in a few different places in the body. So here we can actually see the jaw and this is movement of a joint anteriorly in a horizontal plane. And we're actually sticking it out. Protraction, this can happen at the scapula as well, pushing the scapula forward, rounding that back. Or we can retract where we pull the actual bone back into position moving that joint anterior uh, moving the joint posteriorly would be retraction elevation and depression can also happen at the jaw and the scapula elevation is a structure moves superiorly depression moves the joint inferiorly so opening the jaw is depression closing the jaw is elevation shrugging your shoulders up elevation of the scapula pushing the shoulder blades down depression Opposition is unique to the thumb and fingers, and this is going to be pinching the thumb and fingertips together. That is opposition, hence the term opposable thumb.
plantar and dorsiflexion happens at the foot. Plantar flexion is pointing the toes or tiptoe, um, pointing the toes downward. And elevating the toes upwards or pulling the toes towards the shin is dorsiflexion. And our final movement that we'll cover will be at the foot with eversion and inversion. Twisting the foot to face the sole outward is eversion, and twisting the foot to face the sole inward is inversion.